weirdest thing I've ever done. No library books were harmed in the making of this video. I'm gonna take this off. Yeah, so today I made a throne out of books and made a crown out of a sticky note. How's your quarantine going? But you know what? For the first, like, two thirds of this book that I'm about to review, nothing really happened and there was no drama, so I had to add the drama somewhere. This is by no means the only book thrown on YouTube. Jordan Harvey did one. Caleb from Insane Reader did one. Wait, were those not meant to be tutorials? This is not that comfortable. Obviously, I am no queen or king of booktube. I am a mere peasant. However, I did want to review the Gwenevy Deception today, which is about a queen. And honestly, like, what else am I going to do with my time? Something useful that contributes to the world? We're falling everywhere. Hopefully this holds up. Throne tour! So this is the base of my throne, which is currently supporting me physically and emotionally. I have some nice books on the sides for armrests and then I have some books at the top because those are quite frankly they're royalty you know I own mostly paperbacks hence paperback funds so this is a very squishy and short throne but that's okay we're here for mediocre quality so let's get on with this and actually talk about what I wanted to come here and talk about today which is the Guinevere Deception by Kirsten White. Deception. That was a nice Lion King reference out there for all you Lion King 2 fans. It was almost as good as the first one. The Guinevere Deception. My friend and I read this together and it was just a lot of fun. Light spoilers for this book. Not like huge spoilers, but like light spoilers. So just be warned if you don't want any spoilers, don't watch this video. Go away. Bye. This book got quite a few middle of the road reviews. A lot of three stars. I give it four stars. It was just a really comforting, fun read. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's not the most spectacular, amazing read. It doesn't have some wonderfully lyrical language or like characters you would die for or this wonderful detailed world building. But what it does have is a main character that's very easy to roast and that's gonna be about 75% of this video. Honestly, roasting the main character was one of the most enjoyable parts of reading this book for me. Apart from the fact that it was a retelling and those are usually very comforting to me, especially like Arthurian ones for some reason. I should probably tell you what this book is actually about. This is a YA retelling of the Arthurian legend, so like Arthur, Merlin, all that crew. And what Kirsten White does particularly well is take a male-focused story and switch it up and make it a female-focused story. So this time we're following Guinevere, who is the queen, and there is actually a bit of deception. Deception! Because her name isn't Guinevere, it's something else. And she's actually a sorceress in disguise, who Merlin has sent to Camelot so that she can be there to protect Arthur from magical threats because Arthur isn't able to do that because all magic has been banned from Camelot. So like I said before, this wasn't like some amazing blow your mind read. We weren't shooting for the stars here. I just, it was a warm, fun, comforting read. And that's okay, who doesn't need one of those every now and then? Also, let's play a game called, did I actually like this book that much? Or did I just really like the cover because it was so pretty? So let's talk about the characters. We have Arthur, who is brave, strong, good-hearted, whatever, he's typical Arthur. Merlin is a crazy old wizard who lives in the woods. Mordred is really likable until he's not. Most of the knights remain irrelevant. And then there's Guinevere, and all you need to know about her is she has great hair, she's scared of water, she's not that good at magic, and at no point during this book does she actually have a clue what's going on around her. So we start the book with Guinevere's wedding, she goes to Camelot and is like, oh my god, Arthur, and they get married, and for most of the first part of the book, Guinevere just spends it imagining a magical threat against Arthur when there really doesn't seem to be one, and by that I mean she literally sees a woman give a bag of rocks to a knight, and she's like, hmm, that's suspicious. <laughs> Someone left a Goodreads review, which basically said that the first Two thirds of this book felt like when you're playing a video game and you don't know how you're supposed to complete the level so you just keep running around the same room looking for an exit and they're not wrong. I felt like a lot of the beginning was kind of just filling pages of giving Guinevere something to do before we got to the actual action at the end. It was mostly just Guinevere and her maid Branwen or Bran, Bran I don't know how to pronounce her maid's name but basically it's just them sort of wandering around doing stuff. They go to a tournament to see all these knights compete and basically like anyone can enter and then if you're good enough then you can join Arthur's squad of knights which is basically like a medieval fraternity. So they go see these tournaments and there's a knight called the Patchwork Knight and it's called that because 
No one has ever seen this knight take off their armor, but they're really, really good. And Guinevere is really suspicious for like no good reason. So the way that magic works is you take elements like iron or something like that and you tie them into knots. So it's like not magic. So Guinevere keeps like pulling out strands of her hair, tying them into knots and like puts them all over the castle. She keeps tying her like nasty hair around Arthur's wrist to protect him. Literally like every two pages, she's pulling out hair. And I'm like, girl, if you keep doing this, you're gonna be looking like the Cynthia doll from the Rugrats. So as Guinevere is randomly suspicious of this rock lady and this knight and she's tearing her hair on everything that she sees, she's realizing that she doesn't really remember much of her childhood. Like people would ask her where she grew up and she would just be like, I have no idea. And she realizes it's because she's been taught magic by Merlin. And how Merlin teaches magic is he just takes the information and shoves it in your brain. And apparently like when he shoves the information in your brain, like other information falls out. Like. I don't know, the way that it was explained, it was like, zoop, like you just lose stuff. I don't know about that. When I was cramming for my year 12 exams, I didn't forget like my name or how I grew up. I just forgot regular stuff, like how to use language and how to sleep more than four hours at a time. My favorite scene in the whole book was when they went to a marketplace, right? And so it's Guinevere, Mordred, and Guinevere's handmaiden, Branwen. And this little kid comes up to her because she's like the queen. And the kid smiles and has like lost some baby teeth. Guinevere's like, oh my god, that poor child is never gonna be able to eat again. Like, she forgot that baby teeth were a thing. Like, she forgot that we lose our teeth and then grow them back again. She thought that child was gonna be toothless their whole life. And Branwen and Mordred are just like, what? <laughs> like, you know they're doing that Jim from the office look between them. Marilyn, I'm all for education, but please. Not at the cost of Guinevere's dental hygiene. At another point in the market, we meet this guy who she describes in like the best way. He was shaped like a gourd with four twigs stuck in for arms and legs and a head balanced on top. He blew a gust of air through a tremendous mustache. What is that? Shaped like a gourd? Anyway, at this point I was like, I bet you that Guinevere is actually some magical powerful being because obviously from some other little details that we get, Merlin likes to collect those kinds of people and just like have them. He's like that one guy in Monopoly who only buys Park Lane and Mayfair. Another weird detail that we got is Mordred always being around horses and whispering to horses, like he's free and Dr. Doolittle, but make it medieval. So Arthur knows that Guinevere is actually a sorceress and their marriage is more like a partnership. He can depend on her, she can't really depend on him because he's always going out and like saving Camelot and doing all these important things, which you know, fair enough. But Arthur isn't really around for a lot of the book, he's kind of more like a decoration. Plus Arthur is kind of a love with like the patchwork knight every single time the patchwork knight is mentioned he pops up and he's like oh, the patchwork knight i want to fight him i want to beat him i think that would be really fun bros being bros you know nothing more than that just want to take a little tumble with the patchwork knight <sighs> and then at this point in the book i had to stop little miss i forgot my own name over here gets her period and she doesn't know what it is but i was like how old is this girl? Is she like 13? have i been reading about a 13 year old being married to an 18 year old this entire time that's not kosher. What? But then a couple chapters later, we learn, oh, she's 16. Okay, we can all calm down now. So throughout the whole book, we're getting little passages from the antagonist's perspective. Most of the time, the antagonist is kept very vague and seeing Guinevere through like the little moths and rabbits and squirrels and things. They're creeping on Guinevere, Joe Goldstein style, but like with less literary judgment. Even so, it still didn't really feel like there was an immediate threat until like the very end. So Arthur calls Guinevere to come on a trip to meet all of these other kingdoms because that's polite, that's what you do when you're a wife, just first lady things. And on the way back, they all get attacked by a bunch of wolves because the antagonist sent them after her. And this one knight gets his arm like ripped by a wolf. Guinevere heals him using magic, even though Arthur told her not to. Mordred sees Guinevere using magic, but Mordred is a bro and he's not gonna say anything. I mean, he keeps his gossip among his horses. They get back to Camelot and Guinevere so goes back to being really suspicious of this rock lady again. Gwen is just trying to keep herself entertained. I mean, aren't we all? Why do you think I'm here? For a coherent review? No. Another thing that happens is there's randomly a knight who says he's found a dragon and he wants to kill the dragon because that's what you do when you're a knight, you're a man. Ugh. Guinevere follows him, lets the dragon go. The dragon goes away. 
she knocks out the knight and then puts in a false memory of him killing the dragon so that he goes back and tells everyone that he killed the dragon but she doesn't want him to look at that memory too closely so she makes it a really unpleasant memory and makes him think that he cut open the dragon dragon guts spilled all over him and he was so disgusted that he vomited and pooped all over himself now when i say this book reads a little juvenile this is what i mean but the best part is guinevere is like wait a second he's gonna wake up thinking that he's vomited and pooed all over himself and there's not going to be any evidence of that i retire so after she realizes this guinevere starts undressing him and then we fade to black. What did she do? Where did she get the poo from? These are the questions I have for you, Kiss and White. I like how I'm talking about how juvenile this story is when I'm literally sitting on a throne of books with a sticky note in my head. Putting that scene out of your mind for a second, if you can. So one day, Arthur and Guinevere and a bunch of other knights and people go hunting and Guinevere goes off to pick some flowers or something. And then all of a sudden, a wild boar starts attacking her because why not? The... Oh my God! Oh, it fell apart just like the plot of this story did. How fun is it going to be putting all these back on my shelves? Okay, so she's in the forest and this magical boar is coming after her because the antagonist is like controlling all of these forest creatures and sending them after Guinevere. And then who should appear but the patchwork knight who actually turned out to be Lancelot and who also actually turned out to be a woman. We definitely get some Brienne from Game of Thrones vibes from Lancelot. She wants to be a knight. She was born to be a knight. She's wanted to do that her whole life, but she's like scared because she's a girl she won't be able to do it. Turns out Lancelot and the rock lady are friends and nothing is suspicious. They totally just love rocks. I actually don't remember if they addressed what the rocks were for. I think it was like some sort of magic thing, but again, it was like kind of a vague magic. On the way back to Camelot, Lancelot and Guinevere stop at this cave where Merlin lives because of course he just lives in a cave. And this huge stream of water comes down and it forms a lady and the lady's like, ah, I'm gonna trap you in this cave, Merlin. Honestly, I can't even really tell you what happened in that scene. I still am confused. When they get back to Camelot, Guinevere learns that the real deception was on her. Arthur tells Guinevere that Merlin actually sent her to Camelot not to protect Arthur but because he wanted to protect Guinevere from the Lady of the Lake. Which makes sense because Guinevere is not very good at magic and not very good at identifying threats. Turns out the real deception was on you Guinevere. Deception. So all of this means that everything that Guinevere has done up until this point was basically pointless. Also, I'm sorry about all the construction noises. The dads are out today. They are working on their roofs and they're mowing their lawns. Uh, what else happened? Um, Lancelot wins the tournament against Arthur and becomes a knight, but then everybody realizes that she's a girl and they're like, actually, you can't be a knight, which sucks. Mordred and Guinevere finally break the sexual tension and kiss. Guinevere, I don't think I mentioned, has a crush on everybody. She has a crush on Arthur, on Mordred, on Lancelot and then <gasps> gasp Guinevere gets kidnapped by one of the rival kings. Another great part of this book was the chamber pot escape and that is exactly what it sounds like. She's been kidnapped by this king and in order to escape she is doing her business in this little chamber pot. She throws the chamber pot full of her pee into the guard's face and then runs outside and escapes on the back of Lancelot's horse. Honestly I respect that. Lancelot's right. Anything can be a weapon. Even the stank of your own urine. And that's feminism. I'm not really going to talk much about the ending because I've spoiled so much already. But basically, Mordred becomes more Mordred. Lancelot ends up being a knight. Arthur is reliably absent for most of the plot. And Guinevere still doesn't know what's going on. Consistency. I will say some of the scenes at the end were pretty cool. There was this image of this guy getting wrapped up in like a living tree, like wrapping around him. That was kind of gnarly. But overall, this was just fun. Even though I've just roasted the entire cast of this book, I actually really enjoyed it enough to keep going with the series. I know there's going to be a sequel coming. I think this is going to be a trilogy. And the cover for the next book, which comes out next year, so pretty. So I'll probably read it. I'm basically a magpie. I just get attracted to shiny things. Since Mordred is basically not an option, 
Arthur has basically friend-zoned his wife, which means that Lancelot and Guinevere are going to have like a little bit of a romance, which is great. It makes sense because in the Legends, Guinevere ends up with Lancelot. Very excited for that. I guess it's time for me to descend from my throne and put all of these books back. That's going to be fun. I also just realized that I took off my crown and forgot to put it back on. This was so extra. This was so stupid. Why did I do this? Also, if you watch the Merlin TV show, we have the same battle wounds, and I would love to reopen those old wounds with you if you want to talk through that shared trauma of the finale. But I think it's time for me to stop talking now. So, bye.